Good day. Uh, we, I'd like to welcome you all to our TMIT National Research Testbed High Performer Webinar Series. And today our topic is Transforming Healthcare Leadership. Uh, we are really, really pleased to have a, a terrific set of speakers, uh, uh, academicians, uh, practitioners, and uh, folks that can really put together, I think, some great content uh, from a book that uh, has been uh, recently released. Uh, first off, however, I would like to remind our audience of Julie Tao. Uh, Julie was one of our TMIT fellows and in a, over a dinner with one of our safety leaders at the IHI meeting, uh, I was told that Julie was a nurse, uh, a much-loved nurse who uh, was criminally indicted for uh, a fatigue and systems-related error that she made that led to the death of a patient. And many of you know that Julie uh, has been very dedicated to help us develop care of the care caregiver content that allows us to really kind of focus on the key issues of taking care of our caregivers who really are the second victim to these terrible events that can occur, these systems issues, and also the, uh, the, the terrible things that happen when we turn on folks uh, from our own field. Uh, unfortunately, Julie has had another tragedy in her life and the loss of one of her four sons in a tragic car accident uh, last week. So we, we ask you all to hold uh, her in your thoughts and prayers uh, as we go forward. Uh, Julie's life has been one of, uh, uh, of great service and dedication to patients and families and has been able to rally through these terrible tragedies of, what, of, of being involved in the death of a patient due to a systems error and, and was a single parent when uh, she, we uh, invited her to become a fellow uh, with us when she had no way to be employed and she was uh, on probation after this terrible event and when she uh, was criminally indicted and uh, had uh, kind of terrible experience and was able to rally, uh, rally forth and continue to care for uh, caregivers. And so we want to thank uh, uh, Julie, and we know that uh, uh, she and her family are, uh, are, we need to remember she and her family because that's what this is really all about is, is, uh, is the impact that we can have on families of caregivers as well as families of our patients. Uh, I'd like you uh, also just, uh, and I'll just mention a few things here, just to make sure that you can have a good experience with the webinar. Go to the lower left-hand corner of your screen and make sure uh, make sure that you have your volume turned totally up so that you can hear uh, our speakers. And we record the the webinar as well so that you can listen to it later. If you can't hear it, click on the button in the lower left-hand corner, and we can help you with another phone line so that you can have a good experience. Uh, I'm on slide five. And just to remind those that don't have the slides, go to www.safetyleaders.org and you can click on uh, what's new and be able to focus on uh, our, uh, our webinar uh, uh, for today and download the slides in PDF version. Uh, on slide six, you'll see where you can go back to listen to uh, this webinar. And also, it has the cover of Transforming Healthcare Leadership, which is the book written by our speakers today. Um, and again, on slide seven, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, our calling really is to save lives, save money, and create value in the communities we serve. That is slide eight. I won't read our disclosure statement, but our speakers have all made their disclosures. Uh, and you can, uh, and no funder or edu educational grantor has had any influence or contact with us regarding this, uh, this program. So I'd like to turn things to one of our wonderful patient safety advocates who has been a longstanding contributor to uh, uh, the work that uh, that all of you are doing in patient safety and quality. Dan Ford uh, has recently retired as a vice president of First Group uh, and has been a co-author of, of numerous uh, articles and served on committees uh, that have uh, helped us really focus on patient engagement. And we'd like to have Dan ground us today in, in the focus. And Dan, a few words of wisdom to help us focus on the family, so the voice of the patient and family, Dan. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, I'm sad, too, to, to uh, hear about uh, Julie's son, Nathan. Uh, if my facts are correct, he had served four tours as a Marine in Iraq. So this family was truly is truly service-oriented. My prayers go out to them. I uh, appreciate, once again, being involved, Chuck. I, I want to welcome um, our participants, our, our speakers, uh, our participants first, uh, those of you who are listening in and those who will be joining. Uh, Dr. McAbee, as well, uh, Cliff and Jane Norman as speakers. Uh, Doug Wilson will be a reactor. I'll be a reactor. And uh, 
uh, having retired recently as a healthcare executive search consultant, uh, I can readily say the the spirit and the ideas and the creativity and the motivation and the nudging that comes out of this book is absolutely wonderful and is timely. So, I, so I look forward to as well to uh, hearing their presentation. Great. So, uh, as Dan said, uh, we'll have uh, have uh, uh, Michael Maccabee speak, Cliff Norman, and Jane speak, and then Doug uh, Wilson, uh, who is uh, has uh, an enormously talented individual uh, who has contributed in many different ways, and I think recent now has a blog. We'll have him tell us a little bit about the blog that he's now uh, uh, now. Um, uh, contributing to uh, uh, and uh, is really a great contributor not only to leadership but across the board in multiple industries. Dan, who I just introduced, uh, and then we'll also uh, have our authors uh, of the, the book after they speak contribute to uh, the interactive dialogue. Uh, so it's a real honor to introduce Michael Maccabee, uh, who is the president of the Maccabee Group. He, for 35 years, he's been a consultant and coach to leaders in corporations, unions, universities cities, the World Bank. Uh, he's worked in 36 countries in the Americas, Europe, Asia, Middle East, and Africa. For those of you that uh, have listened to him speak, we gave him 20 to 25 minutes uh, soon after the book was released to speak and, and in effect was kind of a preview to this presentation which will give us a, a much deeper dive with his two co-authors. Uh, he's uh, internationally known for his books in leadership and pioneering projects to improve uh, the, the workspace. Uh, after meeting them, and, and Doug Wilson was the one that introduced us, uh, I, I had the opportunity of uh, reading his book and actually sharing it with others, and I think it has enormous value to all of us who have uh, been uh, been uh, following and worked with IHI and other performance improvement groups. It takes us with a with a really really good uh, provides uh, uh, to us a really wonderful structure uh, that we can uh, uh, that we can follow. Uh, I'd also like to uh, introduce uh, you to Cliff Norman, and he's a consultant with Associates and Process improvement. I just want to remind you all with, from a full disclosure, we have no financial relationship with either any of the three or regarding their book. Uh, and But uh, Cliff will share, I hope, some of their recent experiences in Singapore and in Asia where they've implemented a lot of these systems. And so there's an opportunity for us to think about, uh, you know, so many of the fundamentals that, uh, that apply. Uh, he has more than 20 years of experience in manufacturing and quality. He began his uh, career with Norris Industries and McDonnell Douglas um, he, uh, from 1979 to 86. He facilitated the effort to implement quality improvements throughout Otis Engineering. So he really has a terrific um, uh, uh, terrific experience in applying statistical thinking to their educational uh, uh, offering. Jane Norman, uh, also internationally recognized consultant uh, uh, in this area of leadership and working together as a team, uh, has had uh, tremendous experience, 30 years of experience. She's consulted with leaders and developed improvement professionals in manufacturing, food, distribution, technology, software, uh, and is uh, a partner with, uh, with, with Cliff in their work. And I'm sure they'll share more so I'm going to get off of the uh, uh, off of the mic here and have uh, have them carry forth so that we can really have a deeper dive in what they've laid out for us in this book, which I have now on slide 16. And we're going to give them generous time to present. We'll give our reactors generous time, and then we'll open things up for interactive dialogue. And so we want to remind you that in the Q&A section, you could start adding questions anyway, anywhere through the dialogue, and then I'll field them and, and then throw them to to our authors and our reactor panelists as they speak. So uh, with that, Michael, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, let's see the next uh, slide. Next slide. Kyle, can you move it forward or let me move it forward? I'm doing it. Okay, yeah. great. There we go. Uh, I want to start out by saying this book is, uh, this book is based on our experience. It includes uh, uh, the cases that we have seen which illustrate um, the aim of the book. Uh, it has the conceptual tools for, the, for you to use uh, for transformation of healthcare organizations. And it's based also on uh, 
starting out with a, a study that I did with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, looking at 15 of the best healthcare care organizations in the country and looking at what they had in common, looking at their leadership. And then uh, both uh, the Normans and I have been consultants to healthcare care organizations. And the Normans particularly have worked in Sweden, Canada, United Kingdom, and Singapore. So this book really is not just theory. It puts together both theory, including uh, what we have learned from W. Edwards Deming and Russell Acoff on, on systems and profound knowledge, uh, together with, uh, with our experience and with real life cases that show what can be achieved. Uh, next one. So we start out with the question, why, why do we want to transform healthcare organizations? The answer is very clear. Um, <clears throat> to achieve the triple aim. And the triple aim is improving patient care at the same time that we're decreasing costs and improving population health. And uh, everything in this book is aimed at this triple aim. Next. <clears throat> how do sure. health care organizations have to uh, change? How, so, how do we go about actually uh, causing this uh, transformation? And a big part of that is what uh, Deming uh, taught us uh, early on is that uh, part of it is what we call breaking down uh, barriers uh, on the left-hand side from um, organizational chart thinking and actually moving to understanding the organization uh, viewed as a system, uh, what uh, Dr. Maccabee uh, has helped Jane and I understand the organization viewed as a social system and how things interact and uh, achieve, hopefully, a common purpose uh, with a focus on, on patients. And usually over here, uh, something that's usually missing is the patient. And uh, a lot of the improvement efforts and so forth uh, of late, people say, well, you know, we really need to include the patient and all the rest of it. And Dr. Deming, Russell Acoff, and others saw that immediately, that the patients are connected to the system. And of course, anything we do in all our efforts to improve uh, need to include them and be focused on them. And the triple aim uh, basically is a, uh, a statement of Dr. Deming's uh, idea of the chain reaction, that as we focus on improvement of a system, he said, anybody can tell you with two words that's ever actually worked, uh, why costs go down, uh, and that's less rework. And in healthcare, sometimes that can be dangerous as we talk about uh, patient safety and the rest of it. So this transformation is huge. Uh, when we start talking about the attributes of a learning organization, uh, all that is focused on the social system itself, focused on the purpose, and actually uh, helping uh, families and uh, while we're doing that, uh, achieving uh, knowledge about population health. And that, that all gets into, as we make improvements, that we're making sure that we're sharing that uh, innovation and improvement, not only internally, but externally, uh, to the community to improve population health. So as we look at uh, transformation, many times uh, we talk about leadership, but we don't really talk about how that really affects management. And so as we look at management, uh, in contrast, there's a natural tension between management and uh, leadership. Management is based on task accomplishment, following the procedures and protocol. Uh, management can be delegated. I can ask someone to do these tasks. But leadership, as we've learned from Dr. McAbee, is that is based on relationships. And I can't transfer my relationship with another person uh, to, to them uh, as I could do with management. So we say leadership cannot be delegated and, and therefore the relationships can't be delegated. So when we start looking at a learning organization, we find leadership is identifying things to change and uh, management is trying to uh, uh, finish those things that, that they're, they're assigned to do, run the organization, uh, do, follow the protocol, follow the procedures. So, so uh, by taking the learning from the organization, those people who are actually uh, running things and 
understanding those ideas, uh, we can leverage uh, those ideas and manage that into the roles so that people are not just managing to a protocol, but actually learning from each other, sharing that learning, and leading uh, innovations and uh, discoveries. Uh, you can't get rid of management, obviously, and frankly, we don't want to get rid of leadership either, but they're both very necessary for the success of organizations, and, and the best leaders that we have found uh, lead with the head, thinking, and the heart, compassion, so that we have knowledge, courage, and compassion tied together, which is extremely important when we talk about safety issues. Michael? Yeah. Um, next one. You know, uh, what do we have to do to transform healthcare organizations? One thing I think we need to keep in mind is that a lot of the practices today in our healthcare organizations are based either on a model that, uh, of industrial production as though we were just producing a product. And we're really in a world of a knowledge service world. Production depends on relationships. Uh, you cannot, for example, a lawyer cannot be successful if his client isn't giving him good information. And a doctor can't be successful unless the patient, the relationship with the patient, maybe the family also, is productive. And this whole change to a learning organization has a great deal to do with developing relationships. Jane has just talked about the fact leadership is a relationship. And uh, it's no longer possible to uh, have a kind of bureaucratic system where each person is in their little box. We know that the best healthcare organizations today, with Mayo Clinic or Geisinger or, or Cleveland Clinic, has to do with, with, with coordinated care, with relationships, with relationships between doctors and other providers, with nurses, et cetera. But a lot of what we need to do to get to this transformation is to look at a lot of management myths that may have worked within an old system, within an industrial system, but do not work in a learning organization. And we've addressed in the book 12 myths that we see very often when we try to work with healthcare organizations that need to be addressed. You know, Mark Twain once once said, uh, you know, uh, it's not what you don't know that's going to get you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that isn't true that that's going to get you into trouble. And a lot of these myths are things that people know for sure. Now, here are, the, here are some of the myths that we're going to highlight today. One of them is Leaders are born, not made. Uh, second, the best results are gained by managing by the numbers. Third, people need to be held more accountable. Four, incentives will get people to change. Very commonly believed. Five, to motivate people, we just need to pay attention to them and be caring bosses. And six, to improve quality, it costs more. Now, we have others in the book, but these are the ones we're going to focus off today, starting with, with uh, leaders are born, not made. Now, one thing, one thing that you see so often a big difference between the best organizations and uh, ones that get into trouble. The ones that get into trouble is often because people are promoted to leadership because they're good performers, not because they have the, the, the qualities that fit their role. And we see three kinds of leadership roles that are essential that need to work together as a team. That is strategic leaders. These are the people who, who develop the vision, who set the, uh, the direction. And operational leaders, these are the people who really focus on making the systems, the processes work that fit the strategy and the values. And also networking leaders. These are the kind of leaders like uh, you would find in the Mayo Clinic who would get a all, all the providers together, working together with the patient, uh, so, it's, so people don't have to go from one place to the other. Now, all three of these 
kinds of leaders need to be developed. And, uh, and they have different qualities. And they, they may even have different uh, motivational uh, value systems. Uh, but it's not that they're born that way. It's that we, we are reinforcing and developing qualities that are very different in different kinds of leadership roles. The, uh, the second myth has to do with uh, understanding uh, variation. And we talk about uh, people like to say that they're managing by the numbers. And as I read that title, I'm reminded of Dr. Deming in his four-day seminar. He would ask people, uh, he would say, anybody here not doing their best, please stand. And he'd been asking that question for over uh, 50 years. And so far, no one had confessed. So he said, given the results that we're seeing, one could only assume that we're being killed by best efforts. He said, people doing their best, he said, while not understanding a system, not understanding variation, not understanding psychology, not understanding how people learn, and all the rest of it. And this idea of variation, uh, we've dedicated a chapter to this, as well as the other three of the science of improvement. This has high leverage. And it's through this window that Dr. Deming uh, entered and understood the need for a system, understood the need for personality intelligence, and understood the need for a methodology to use uh, the idea of uh, learning uh, through uh, the PDSA cycle and so forth uh, to actually uh, cause improvement to happen. So just been a second on this. The uh, thing in vogue right now within healthcare, not only healthcare, but throughout the, uh, the world and all industries, uh, somehow or another we've been transfixed on uh, comparing uh, measures uh, to goals. And uh, if you're above or below the goal, uh, you'll uh, get a green or red light, and then uh, if you're right on it uh, or near it, uh, you'll get a caution light, uh, yellow, and all the rest of it. Now, one of the things that we find as Jane and I start trying to make improvements, usually when people start working, they find that the data that's available is not the data they need for improvement. And this is particularly true in healthcare, where a lot of the data that's actually stored and used and readily available has been made available to outside agencies for the purposes of judgment and accreditation. And so we see a lot of classification measures and that kind of thing that usually isn't uh, useful for the kind of short-term improvements that we're looking for. We're usually looking for people to finish a project and get results within 100 days. And uh, so we need data very quickly and timely uh, in order to actually start making changes. Uh, and what we find is when we go in, we start looking at the data, we see data that's uh, set up for judgment and really not learning. An example, if I take one of these and pull it out, for example, this one is the rate of unplanned uh, returns to the emergency department. Which many of those people on this call uh, know about and, and probably measure. You can see the target on this has been uh, is at uh, 7.5 or less. This green line represents the target. We can see the data over the months here. And of course, this has been green uh, for two years on the management report. Uh, we've effectively put them to sleep. And here I have a, a, a trend here, the chances of that happening, like being mauled by a regular bear and a polar bear on the same day. And uh, whatever happened back here, and the team needs to be looking at that. Unfortunately, they don't get to see uh, the control chart. Now, if we had the control charts or run charts connected uh, to the, uh, the red and green lights, that would be a, that would be a real advancement here. So that's one of the things that uh, Jane and I uh, work on quite a bit. The, uh, this is another example. It's one of my favorites. Uh, you see the chart on the left here is what, what the management would see over time. Of course, they're seeing one light a month. And then it's green and then red. You know, And this is infection rates per 1,000 patients. And this particular data shows that, uh, as Dr. Deming would look at this, is from common cause variation. And the only way that an improvement is going to happen here is if somebody wades in and starts changing the system and get the system under suspicion. And so that's a whole different meeting than just announcing that the figure's red or green or whatever it is. And so you'll notice here anything below a 2 is a green light. Anything above that, you know, if they're close to it, is yellow. And then above that is red. None of this would be a problem if, if it wasn't creating waste. But unfortunately, it does. And this is uh, kind of Schuhart's work put in a table. And Dr. Walter A. Schuhart, the fellow who invented the control chart, he said managers make two kinds of mistakes. He's on one now and then, 
and the other now and then. He said they're not making one, they're probably making the other one. And mistake one is to, is to overreact, and mistake two is to underreact. And when he designed the control chart with the, uh, the three sigma limits on it that we've just shared, the whole idea of that was to minimize these two kinds of mistakes and allow the leader, the person using the control chart, to make these correct decisions more often. So if it wasn't doing harm and it wasn't wasting valuable resources and valuable time, it wouldn't be a big deal. Jane's going to talk later about probably one of the most vicious things that comes out of this is the attribution errors, when we start blaming people who are near the defects without understanding the system. So that is myth number three. People need to be held more accountable. Uh, so for uh, uh, an adverse drug event, for example, uh, it's obviously the person who's, who's done, done the deed and uh, not the system that's uh, uh, contributed. And uh, so this is what we're talking about, the attribution error. And the attribution error uh, simply is uh, we attribute the blame to the person, not to the system. Uh, it's a tendency because we really don't have pictures of our system or our processes as they interlink. Uh, we uh, see the organizational chart, and it, when we look at a system, uh, we see um, uh, just um, people. We see people. So when something goes wrong, we want to know who did it and uh, what happened and why did they do that. And we kind of put the target on their back, as this shows. What we learn from variation and from profound knowledge, which is system thinking, part of uh, it is the variation in the system thinking and thinking about the people, is that this uh, example that Cliff just talked about is telling us it's common cause variation, which really means that the system is dominating. The system is designed right now to get the infection rate that we're getting. And if we want a better re infection rate, just uh, putting a goal there is not going to do it. We have to take a complex issue like that, identify where most of the infections are coming from, start taking it apart and actually doing improvement and designing or redesigning processes, products, or services to help us change that whole system result, which we call the measurement, and move the whole results down so that everyone can achieve the, uh, the uh, goal of the infection rate that we want. Um, attributing a point to an individual because it's high or talking to a uh, manager and saying, why are your infection rates high this month without understanding whether it's common or special cause is really wasting people's time, which is what Cliff was just talking about, the two types of mistakes. So we look at healthcare as an interconnected system. If you look at the center here, this is what we call the delivery part of our system, which is where our, our, our patient actually walks through the system. As leaders, and, uh, as leaders and top management and executives, we're actually up in these driver and influencing processes, and we look at the, the feedback from our stakeholders. We, we look at existing healthcare applications and technology. We have to look at regulatory policies and create strategic plans to do certain things. And then we have to run the organization, which is down here in the support. But when things go wrong in this system, we have to see how it's designed. Much like if I said tomorrow, uh, we're all going to drive on the left-hand side of the road. We, we go to a lot of countries that are like that. And we could all pledge to do that and have a goal to do that. But the minute we walk out and get in our car, we want to live. And the system is designed for driving in the right-hand side of the road in the United States. So the system is dominating the actions that we're taking. Um, Dr. McAbee? Yeah. Uh, Jane has just talked about the importance of understanding the system. And I can't uh, emphasize too much how crucial it is if you are creating a learning organization, transforming bureaucracies, to understand the nature of system. The definition of a system, a system is a interconnected qualities that work together 
to reach a common purpose. And no part of that system can be evaluated or understood by itself, only in as much as it is supporting the purpose of the system and interacting with the other part. Now, you know, we, we can all think about mechanical systems like a car. And obviously, if you, if you were to pick the parts of the car just about the best the best parts in the world and put them together, the, the car wouldn't work at all. Uh, however, when we're dealing with a healthcare organization, we're dealing with a social system where the parts come in with purposes of their own. And one of the key elements of leadership is creating that common purpose and motivating uh, people to work together and engaging them. And you know, uh, the recent Gallup studies show that uh, only 30% of Americans are engaged in their work. And one reason is because of the myth that incentives will get people to change or will engage people or get them motivated. Um, Harry Harlow, a professor at Wisconsin, way back in the 40s, did an experiment with monkeys. He gave the monkeys uh, a problem to solve, opening up doors and getting into different rooms. And the monkeys learned this. They seemed to enjoy solving the problem. Then he, he, he put in an incentive. He put in, if they did the problem right, they'd get a banana. And what happened? Their actual performances dropped. They got worse. Why? They were thinking about the bananas and not the problem. Incentives, material incentives, rewards, punishment, threats can generally increase productivity and motivation. Transactional work is work that does not engage intrinsic motivation and work that <coughs> people are only doing in order to get uh, paid. <coughs> but if you, uh, if you put in incentives and in knowledge work, it's going to be like the monkey. Um, the, uh, all the evidence shows that <clears throat> putting in material incentives to professionals, to people who really are doing their work, work best because it, it connects with their intrinsic motivation, becomes negative rather than positive. For example, think about it. If you, is a, uh, is a good physician going to uh, do his job better? treat a patient better because he's paid more? Or is he going to try to see more patients uh, to make more money <clears throat> with the result that the performance deteriorates? Less time with each patient. Next. The uh, one thing that uh, when we write in this book, uh, Dr. McAbee, asked Shane and I what we wanted out of it, and we said an education, and uh, Dr. McAbee worked real hard at trying to educate us over a three-year period while we wrote this book. One of the things that we had to unlearn that we actually learned from Dr. Deming was that, you know, it's important that you understand you really can't motivate people, try to align yourself with people who are intrinsically motivated, and um, McAbee uh, pretty well turned that on its ear for us with his uh, four R's, as he called them then, and he said leaders really need to be able to help people understand the reasons to follow. In fact, early on in the book, we asked uh, Dr. McAbee how he defined leadership. He said it's actually pretty simple. He said uh, leaders have followers. And uh, in order to have followers, uh, they're obligated to explain the reasons uh, why uh, we're doing what we're doing. The next thing is, is to understand our responsibilities uh, in carrying out our roles and how we support the purpose of the system and then our important relationships in the organization and also with people outside the organization, which we find over and over again is absolutely critical. Uh, there's a fourth one here that Jane added during the writing of the book, and uh, uh, Jane and Dr. McAbee uh, went around and around for about three months uh, debating whether or not recognition uh, deserved to be an R, and uh, finally uh, Michael sent me an email about 2 o'clock in the morning and he said he had uh, awakened and realized that Jane was right. And uh, he said the whole idea of recognition goes into one of the seven basic value drives of the human being, that as we recognize contributions they've made to the system, it allows them to take dignity. And he didn't copy Jane on email, but uh, the, uh, 
<laughs> we all worked that out pretty well, and it's one of the things that uh, contributed greatly to what we call the five R's now. And then the last part is the idea of rewards, which are of two types, intrinsic and extrinsic. And that kind of leads to a table that, uh, that Michael has put together, which kind of shows the best possible situation is where I've got somebody who actually cares about the work high on intrinsic motivation, and they're actually getting paid uh, to do what they're, they're doing, and so that's the motivated. Uh, the least situation is what I call prison, is where they really don't care about the work, and they're really not being paid to do it, and that's in the demotivated uh, lower quadrant. And what we can get is if we can uh, over-justify and pay somebody uh, to do something, they don't care about the work, then I'll have somebody that's very compliant. And of course, then they'll show up in that survey that, uh, that uh, Dr. McAbee just referenced to Gallup, uh, that Gallup did, where they won't be uh, uh, engaged in their work. And then, of course, the lower tragic, I think, for most of us, and would lead to uh, total frustration where we actually care about the work uh, uh, but we have uh, no, uh, we're not being paid uh, adequately in order to carry that out. The, uh, the last one there, and I, I think this is um, critical, is the uh, Dr. McAbee's idea of uh, leadership philosophy. When he first explored this with us, he talked about the, uh, the four parts of this, and the first is the leader being able to explain the purpose of the organization and understanding at what level of ethical and moral reasoning uh, did they want to operate? And in the book, you'll see three levels. The first level comes, they come from Colbert at Harvard, where he says, level one is, I'm going to take care of me. Uh, level two is, I'm going to take care of me and my department and my organization. And in level three, I'm actually willing to take a sacrifice for me and or my department in order to actually help out uh, the larger system. And uh, this actually enables, once we understand these three levels, as we're having conversations internally, uh, you might hear somebody say, well, I'd like to do that for the patients, but that would hurt my budget. And that's uh, clearly a level two uh, comment. And somehow or another, we've got systems in place that are not allowing this person uh, to actually work for uh, the larger system and operate at level three. The next one there is actually understanding what the practical values are in the organization. What do we actually need to do here in order to achieve our purpose? And uh, Dr. Russell Acoff used to have a test for this. He says, uh, which one of these values are you willing to quit the business over? And uh, that usually is an acid test to find out what's actually real versus what's just being uh, put out as platitudes. The last one, to me, is the bookend of the first one. And so in a lot of organizations, Jane and I work with, uh, the, ma the managers and leaders will say, well, what should we measure? And what we do is we take the purpose of the organization and the statements out of that and we actually start saying, well, what measures do we need to have to tell us whether or not we're achieving the purpose? And that's how we develop uh, the measures and, uh, the, and define results in that fourth one, which I think is critical. And you'll see that example in the book from Cherokee Nation. Jane. So our sixth myth is, uh, is one that, that we've heard for 30 years, you know, to improve quality, it costs more. There's going to be trade-offs. And uh, when people start saying the word trade-offs, we already know that they're on the inspection side. They're thinking about judgment. They're thinking about making, not redesigning something so it can't happen or that it's unlikely to happen or try, we're not trying to design things that make it easy to do the right thing and hard to do the wrong thing. We are, uh, we are looking at it a different way. And we, so, so here's a picture we like to show uh, helping people. We learned this from Dr. Duran and Dr. Deming in the, in the 70s and 80s. And during that time, we didn't have a lot of examples on the right-hand side. But we had lots of examples on the left-hand side. And when we add more inspection, which adds cost, you'll see this going up, our defects will go down because we're sorting them out and we're reworking them or we're catching them or we're trying to prevent them. And so because we're adding more inspection and we're audits and those types of things, the costs are going up. But it's also slowing down productivity as well. And what Dr. Deming would tell us is, well, you can have it all. You, you can have it all when you redesign something. You can have it all by taking... Uh, 
taking uh, uh, the process or the product or the service and redesigning it. Or if it exists, uh, we redesign it. And if it doesn't exist, design something absolutely new. And by doing that, we can eliminate those defects so that they, they can happen or it's very difficult for them to happen. Uh, much like carrying a key off of a typewriter, I can't press the key, therefore I can't do it. Many of our information systems are developed to help reduce defects and help us do different things like that. And it reduces our costs. Now, in the old days, we didn't have very good examples of that, but now, I, you know, I, I can look at a at a calculator that in the 70s I had paid $350 for, and it all it had was multiplication, addition, subtraction, and division, and square root, which was real important when I was doing quantitative analysis and my chemistry work. And uh, now I can buy one for a dollar with solar, um, solar, power. solar power. And I mean, it has more features, and uh, and it costs less. So as we redesign things, we uh, eliminate those defects. The defects that we're having with slide rules don't even exist anymore. So that's how we have to think. We have to totally think differently about improvement, not about inspection, and not adding more and more in order to get the defects down. More people, more resources. We have to redesign what we have so that we make it easy to do those right things and hard to do the wrong things. So we use this thing called the Model for Improvement, um, which is in the, uh, 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 the Guide for Quality Improvement as well, and we have that in our Transforming Healthcare Leadership. And it's three basic questions. And interestingly enough, as a, a manager or an executive, uh, we all know that the first question people come to us is not what they're trying to accomplish. It's actually what changes can they make? I want I want this software. I want this. I want to do this. And the questions that we should be asking is, what are you really trying to accomplish? Which causes them to stop and think. And then we say, how do you know that change is an improvement? Have you tested it? How? What evidence do you have? Uh, have you tested it in our environment? Because just because it works in one area doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work flawlessly with our patients and our equipment and our uh, procedures. So the theory of knowledge is critical for learning, and the plan is the deductive part of learning. And from doing our plan, we induce and revise our theories. That, so that is really part of learning. The plan, do, study, act is truly a learning, uh, 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 which is critical in, in the improvement area. And as we work on improvement as a leader, uh, this is actually in the book and a, an example of uh, clients that have done it. As they work in it, they identify those processes that have to be designed or redesigned. If they're brand new, they're in red. Uh, you'll see the little PDSAs here. And now I can look at my system as a whole and see where I'm actually working. This is actually an example of a payer who actually included the people who provided care. And you'll see that two of their big projects were the links between the payer and, and the people who provided care. The, uh, it's interesting, Jane, this, when we look at this picture, there's 23 efforts on here represented by PDSA cycles. And when we went to Sweden, the CEO of Sweden, he was very concerned. He said, you know, Cliff, uh, Jane, they want us to make 62 changes by next Wednesday, and we're really concerned about patient safety. And so we need to be able to have something that shows us and shows our uh, clinicians where the changes are occurring in the system so that as leaders we can coordinate these things and we don't kill Esther. And I said, who's Esther? And he said, well, it's an 83-year-old Swedish woman that we almost dehydrated uh, because of a handoff. And uh, we need to make certain as we make changes in the system we're able to see the system. And he says, after all, if you're going to lead a system, wouldn't it be a good idea to be able to see it? And so this is some of the early work we've done in healthcare 2000 uh, with Sweden. It's critical. So it really helps us see the strategic intelligence that we're using strategy. We have the foresight and the visioning that we partner with others. 
and that we, we are motivated using our leadership philosophy and the four parts of profound knowledge that we've just talked about. Uh, and I, I love this uh, comment. It says, the art of, of skill, of careful planning toward an advantage or desired end. That's really what we want. And, and gaining these skills is really what strategic intelligence is about. We identify a strategy. How do we develop those skills so that we don't harm our patients, so that we can reduce falls and reduce adverse drug events, reduce infections? That, that is critical. Uh, I, I think it's important to know that was Dr. Deming's label uh, for knowledge, but IHI, uh, Institute for Healthcare Improvement, which many people on this phone call know about, they refer to that as the science of improvement. And uh, there's been a lot of contributions in the British Medical Journal of, to really go into depth about the idea of understanding the system, variation, theory of knowledge, and personality intelligence. Critical. Um, Would you like to summarize for us? Yeah. Uh, let me just uh, emphasize something. Um, Jane has just described strategic intelligence. It is generally, I think most organizations are told by consultants to use some kind of roadmap of change. It, in all my experience, the roadmaps don't work because they don't take account of the different contexts, the different needs in different areas, and they say we're going to start out and do this, and then we're going to do this and do that. Instead of roadmaps, you need leadership who have strategic intelligence. If you have the, this kind of understanding, you are going to know how to do it. You're going to know how to use uh, design, idealized design. You're going to know how to bring together a leadership team and to partner with each other to motivate people to do, uh, to make the change. You will develop a philosophy that will bring people together and create the, the values that go together with the processes. So we, we really want to emphasize the importance of strategic intelligence as being equipping leaders to change as opposed to trying to run by some roadmap uh, uh, where you are being taken on by, by uh, a, a set of uh, practices that may not be systemic and may not fit your reality. So to summarize, um, we, have, we talk about the importance of uh, philosophy in leading cultural change. We have shown the importance of moving from bureaucracy to a uh, system of processes that include um, patients as well as the providers. We've talked about the importance of motivation and the five R's and of profound knowledge. All of these things go together uh, to create a system that's based on uh, based on an understanding, a deep understanding of, uh, of strategic intelligence and of what it means to, to design and transform a system from a bureaucracy to a learning organization. <coughs> to summarize, we've got to challenge old ways of thinking, of myths. We've got to leverage learning throughout the organization. Everybody is involved in, uh, in uh, continuous improvement of processes. We have to understand that organizations a social system, which has to align interdependent roles in order to achieve the purpose. We need to uh, have leaders. Uh, management needs to be done. Doesn't always require even require leaders. People can often do the management. But leadership is crucial, and we need leaders who have the different types of leadership skills to fit the roles. We have to understand variation. We have to understand, uh, avoid the attribution error of blaming people rather than understanding that most mistakes have to do with the system. 
And to motivate people, we need to understand the type of work they do. We need to understand their values and connect them to the five R's of motivation. So we are, we are finished with our presentation, and we thank you for your attention. Great. Well, thank you very much uh, for the uh, for this uh, uh, time that you've spent. The, the book is really uh, comprehensive, and it would take much greater time to really go through it in a stepwise fashion. And uh, uh, I have purchased it and shared it with a number of folks, and it got uh, a very positive response. So uh, I would put it at a high recommendation level. I'd like to go to Doug Wilson, and uh, I, int I introduced Doug earlier, and Doug has uh, been a business leader in multiple industries. Uh, in is a leader in, in the concepts of uh, leadership, has a deep uh, bed of knowledge in psychology, and has uh, had his experience in the governance role in healthcare organizations. Uh, Doug, uh, comments, questions, thoughts? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am going to make a comment. I'm going to actually, actually ask Dr. Maccabee a question as well. Uh, when I've known uh, Dr. Maccabee for 30 plus years, and I will say he's the best systems thinker other than Edward Deming I've, I've ever encountered. Uh, the challenge in systems thinking is where do you start, especially if you're not the CEO? How do you get going? And when you look at this, it requires almost a board directive or a CEO. It requires real leadership to make this happen. So if you're on the call and you're not a CEO, what do you do? My, <laughs> you know, my recommendation, and I'm going to ask you, Dr. McAbee, as well, my recommendation is don't feel overwhelmed. Remember, you have to start one thing at a time. Yes, you can try and think about that system, but pick an area you want to improve, start networking to build followers, don't go too fast, it's where you're losing your ground, work hard at it, and start learning in that specific area, this is an objective I'm going to improve in. I'm going to get some results. I'm going to pull on different resources inside the company to make that happen or the organization. And from there, I'll start to gain some ground. Just get a foothold uh, in an area. Don't be discouraged that you have to have this whole system view in order to get started. But uh, Dr. McAbee, I'd like to ask you, what, what are your thoughts on this? If well, I would agree with you, Doug. Doug, I would add that it's important for you to start out with your own philosophy. What Excellent. is your purpose? Mm -hmm. Why are you at work? What are you trying to achieve? How does that fit your personal values? And then find others who share that purpose. And you will find, um, I've seen this a number of times, you find once you get people together who share a common purpose and values, they can do a great deal. That's that's a perfect way to say it. So I would encourage you all, to, and that, that is a great question, too, that that requires that reflection. And, and if you have not done that exercise to step back, and I do it, it's not one of those one-time sort of things. You're constantly asking yourself, what is my purpose in this context? And it, it is a great question. Great. Uh, let's go to uh, Dan Ford, who uh, has had an enormous uh, body of experience in helping hire uh, upper-level uh, uh, leaders, and like to have his comments and questions. And uh, and then uh, uh, what we'll do is uh, we'll swing back to the our, our speakers, and we have some good questions from the audience regarding mid-level management. But let's uh, let's go with Dan. Comments, thoughts, questions of our our speakers. Yes, Chuck, thank you. I, I, um, I've been sitting here thinking about the hat that I have on. I have two hats, retired search consultant and, and then uh, a patient safety advocate who's become a patient advocate who just happened to be an executive search consultant for lots of years. And uh, uh, um, Evelyn or 
Kyle, could you switch to the slide just before the summary here? If you if you if you're right, if you can do that. Um, anyway, it, it talks about yes. Um, I think, and I was thinking, Doug, when you asked, asked that question, and Dr. McAbee responded that I was thinking about you know to have a magnet that that had the word patient on it, and and in any planning you're doing or whatever, you've got a whiteboard you, that you that you could put that magnet on and it would stick. That that the patient is the key to everything, including at the heart of, of I think of, of your response here, Dr. McAbee, if you think through that. Uh, the first one need to challenge old ways of thinking. It's got to involve the patient. We don't. We have not historically done that. We've engaged the patient because they're our, our client. Our, uh, we've been working on them, but we don't think of them as an active partner in their care. Um, the next one involves leverage learning. Uh, patients got to be involved to enhance the learning. I've, I'm an outspoken proponent of inviting patient family to participate in root cause analysis. I can't think of a better way. To, uh, to learn from a, an unfortunate event than to have the actual patient uh, and family member involved. Next one about the social system, and, and, and go back to your graph, you don't have to put this up, but you know you move from the org charts to the, the interdependent system, and the, and the patient, again, is at the heart of that. I think also increasingly of patients as leaders. Um, uh, collectively, the patient, the patient's leaders, collectively, and then individual patient, patient advocates, patients that all you know on the line that you can think back over the years, in their own way, they are wonderful leaders in the roles that they play. Um, I think the patients, the next one, the bullet point down, make better decisions, uh, patient involvement uh, will enhance those decisions. And then the five R's of motivation, the patient is the reason for the five R's and is at the heart of it. I'd like to throw one out one question. We don't have to answer this yet, Chuck, but how do we get boards, hospital and system boards, to get them to really, really cause change along the lines of what we're talking about here when so many take uh, simply take the direction of their CEO? Um, the qualities of CEOs, as we all know, varies all over the place. Uh, they function uh, in their own boxes. Uh, albeit at a higher level in theory, and I, I'm just I'm just curious. Is it, we, it's got to start in many ways uh, with the boards. Some things got to start at the front line with the nurses, but the policy and all of that expectations get set at the top. So I'd I'd be curious at some point what you all think about that piece of it, particularly yeah. as you worked with those 15 systems. Well, I think that's a great question, and uh, I recall some years ago when I when I met with David Lawrence when he was CEO of Kaiser Permanente and he was trying to make this kind of transformation and also much more uh, get the active involvement of patients using IT systems, for example, patients with diabetes to uh, managing their own, uh, their own situation. And uh, he said to me that it was a crucial that he took the board off lot offline, took them away, educated them about what he was doing. They couldn't have done what he did if he, he had not worked a lot with his board. And I think that's a, I saw in another uh, healthcare organization where a CEO tried to make changes and the board uh, undermined him he, because one of the physicians who didn't like the changes, who felt he was being, he was going to lose out with the changes, happened to be the doctor who had saved the life of one of the board members, and that was the end of the CEO, and that was the end of transformation. So uh, it's a great question, and I think uh, that it is absolutely essential that leaders, uh, strategic leaders, educate their boards if they're going to be successful. And also I would add, uh, Dr. McAbee, this is Doug Wilson, that not only do you have to educate the board, but probe the passion of those board members as well and the leadership role they can really contribute, not just as fundraisers, but as a, if it's a nonprofit, or, but really probing, getting at why are you a part of this organization and what is it you're wanting to help create here? And I find that to be a great question for a board member, getting at passion. Very good. 
Fantastic. So, Michael, are, are there other thoughts that came to mind that you'd like to share? And we'll go then to uh, uh, Cliff and then to Jane, and then we'll uh, address some of the questions. And I just want to remind folks that you can add questions, email me, or add them to the Q&A section in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, and uh, we'll be coming to those questions. So, uh, uh, Michael, other thoughts that you'd like to reinforce? Well, I just I, I think those two uh, Questions and comments are very important. They've added, so it's, keep in mind, the, the new learning organization must include the patient because uh, nobody, no doctor uh, cures, uh, no, no uh, provider cures somebody without that person's active involvement and, and commitment to their own health, and we've sometimes lost sight of that. We think we think it's all a matter of treating people like cars going into the shop. And the second point that was made, it's absolutely essential that we think about all of the stakeholders, especially the board, and as Doug pointed out, I think very, very uh, pointedly that um, it's essential to use the five R's with the board not and with the patient, not just with the uh, providers in the system. Thank you. Uh, Cliff, thoughts, yeah. comments, questions? Jane, go right now, and then I'll follow right after her. Um, uh, one thing that we may be missing is the caregiver side, because many times a patient in their distress, you know, one who suffers is a patient, in Latin, uh, the caregivers are the ones who are listening and really helping them care for themselves or actually giving them care. And as a, as a first line uh, caregiver for uh, mothers and stepdads and grandchildren and, uh, and being a patient, uh, the caregiver is many times forgotten in the system. Uh, also, I want to um, I encourage people to realize that, you know, leaders are not just the formal leaders in our organizations. We've got that uh, hierarchy in our head, and we tend to think of leaders as formal. Our most powerful leaders within an organization are those that are informal leaders. Uh, just like uh, Dan made the comment about there's patients that are leaders, there are caregivers that are, that are leaders as well. There are uh, opportunities for that. And I think uh, as we work on, on trying to transform an organization, we have to get co-conspirators. And those co-conspirators may, may be in places of, of formal authority and, and some not in formal authority and working together and, and show them, uh, not just telling them what we need to do, uh, actually getting in there and showing them. Cliff? Yeah, I just want to second what uh, Doug said. I, I think it's real important to get started and to start making a difference and making improvements. Uh, uh, as Dr. Demi used to say at his ember, at the end of his uh, seminar is that uh, keep learning. Uh, people will gravitate to you uh, for knowledge. And I've noticed that when people actually produce an improvement in an organization, an example that other people can study, that usually sets off a chain reaction of uh, what I think is essential is curiosity and uh, not accepting the status quo, but to have the curiosity. Uh, and we find that attributes are critically important for internal people we call improvement advisors, improvement professionals uh, that are actually going to be leading improvement, is to have the curiosity to start asking the questions as to why is this happening and let that drive the improvement. So. That, I guess we're ready for Great. some questions, right? Great. So one of the so the first question is from Susie Quick, and the question and the comment is great presentation. What is the best way to get middle management who are oftentimes ill prepared to understand all of this? They are in the gimba and are critical to all of this. Uh, let's go. Let's just walk through each one of you because I think that you know the studies said and we won't cite them here, but there are numerous studies, including the Estes Park study, that showed that there's a huge disconnect between middle managers and if they th and their belief that the focus is on quality or the mission or the vision or the core values, and it's more about the economics. When the CEO will say, "My staff all know and everyone knows that we're absolutely dedicated," and there's a big disconnect 
disconnect between this middle management area. So let's let's go through each one of you, uh, ending with Dan and 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 address this, Michael, and then comments from each one of you, including uh, Doug. So uh, Michael, go ahead and, and middle management. What do we do about yeah. that? Yeah. Well, we you know, uh, the problem is the whole concept of middle management suggests a bureaucracy, and the problem is so many people. Uh, are, have a hardwired mindset of bureaucracy. They don't really understand a learning organization that's a system. A system doesn't necessarily have to have middle management. You know, we I've seen so many times in bureaucracies, middle management, it, it, we used to call it the clay layer because everything would, all anything that came down would, would be uh, it, like, like water and clay disappear. Um, I think I think if if you do not think systemically of transforming a system, you're not you're you're gonna end up with a bureaucracy with middle management. So uh, don't start just uh, don't start with a bureaucracy where you're trying to change the manager. Start with a whole vision of the transformation of an idealized design of a learning organization. Great. Cliff. I, I just, uh, I, I, I hear what uh, Dr. McAbee is saying. Having uh, worked in those bureaucracies, I can really appreciate the questioner. And I reflect on Dr. Ishikawa, who used to show a picture of an hourglass. And at the top, he would put top management. And at the bottom, he would put, you know, the folks. And uh, he says, you notice how wide it is at the top and how wide it is at the bottom. And then it constricts in the middle. And he said the leaders usually get excited about the change because they're leading it. And the people at the bottom hear about the change and they're excited about it. But then we have these people in the middle that are being held accountable every day for results. They've got to do something. And they don't have time uh, necessarily to divert their attention elsewhere. And so as we introduce change and so forth, it's critical that we involve them and help them understand how the change is actually going to help them and give them reasons that they should be following. So we use the motivation uh, that Dr. McAbee's designed there with the five R's. And, and this group, I really feel for them because they're excited. They want to do the right thing. But they're being held accountable for things that don't allow them necessarily the time uh, to uh, get involved in what they're being asked to go do in addition uh, to their normal job. So it's, it's always a tension. Jane? Uh, she she had to run and uh, join a, another call, so you're Great. stuck with me. So that was uh... <laughs> Great. Uh, Doug, this issue of middle management, you're a very experienced uh, business person in multiple industries and uh, have a wealth of experience in kind of the psychology of leadership. Uh, you know, many of our audience are in middle management, and, uh, you know, and in, you know, this is a big challenge of, of, of the connect, connection in these bureaucracies. We'd love to live in a world where there weren't bureaucracies, but a typical hospital is built on the Prussian military hospital model. That's the pyramid. And, uh, you know, we're, we've got a number of silos delivering uh, individual outputs to patients we move around. Doug, thoughts on the middle management issue? Yeah, uh, a great question, and that was what I was raising initially, basically. There's, and there's no easy answer, but I'll give a few thoughts of my own experience uh, coming into the middle of the organization. First of all, uh, pick that area that you're passionate about. And I liked uh, what Dr. McAbee said as well. Find fellow travelers. Find the people that share your values and start building those alliances inside the middle of the organization and look for every opportunity to influence up. How do you become an influencer up and have people, you can, you can get the attention of the uh, people above you around key ideas, especially if you're getting a new kind of result. If you're leading middle management, a great way to think about this too is really start with those, the values and purpose of this organization and the principles or practices that are going to drive how, how we're going to change. I find that's always a great place to start, especially if you know getting people to step back and really think about the whole system sometimes is just too overwhelming. If I can get you to think about purpose, 
values and practices that we're going to use in a simple way. And then third, pick the highest leverage points in the organization. I'll give an example. In skilled nursing, where I have done a lot of work, the administrator at the site level, along with the nurse, the RN, those two people is, is where the highest leverage for change is. If I influence them, I'm going to influence 100 staff 24 hours a day. And that's where I can have impact. So find where those leverage points are and work on investing at those key leverage points that can increase your, your probability of success, if you will. Well, you know, to uh, add on to what Doug is saying, I was thinking it's hard to know what you mean by middle management sometimes. But I was thinking about <clears throat> when we visited Intermountain Healthcare and in the cardiology you had the you had the uh, chief physician, you had the chief nurse and the administrator working as a team to create pathways that would improve uh, results and uh, and and cut costs at the same time and working also with the with Brent James and the IT department the, with the interactive relationships between these people which you might call middle management. However, they were really supported by the top management who were who were interested in the, in transforming the organization. I, I think to echo what uh, Chuck and Doug both said, I think if we can help uh, leaders in the middle understand how an improvement is actually going to reduce work for them, uh, as Dr. Deming promised in his famous chain reaction, uh, and bring along uh, that idea uh, that usually uh, builds support. And then once we have an improvement effort that's actually successful, of course, victory has a thousand fathers and mothers at that point, and then it begins to spread. So going back to Doug's idea of just getting started and getting started with the idea that we need to help people understand how this is actually going to help improve the system and then actually free up valuable time that they need uh, that they don't have right now. Well, well, great. Listen, uh, what we've done is Kyle has put up so there's enough time for our polling, and I don't want to interrupt our Q&A, so I'm going to just cover the questions of our polling, and then I'm going to come back to a question by one of our attendees, Brian uh, Ashiro, who talks about physicians and engaging physicians. But before we do that, just so everybody can fill out the poll in the lower right-hand corner of the screen, we've got another 17 minutes for the webinar, and these are great, the great dialogue with the, uh, with the reactor panel. But let me just interrupt just for a moment and go through the polling questions. So, the, and so if you look in the lower right-hand corner of your screen, and we'll just uh, put this up because Kyle has already got the polling questions up, uh, we're polling our audience, and, and we want you to give the most affirmative answer is a 10, meaning very strongly agree with the statement, and a 1 is the very least in that you strongly disagree. And the first question is, I am interested in standalone webinars on hot quality issues. And these we, typically we do a lot in patient safety, but we've had an enormous amount of interest in healthcare quality and quality that extends even beyond the acute care hospital to the home that might not be squarely in patient safety and harm reduction, but really optimizing mind, body, spirit quality across the continuum. So we want you to answer, are you interested in a standalone or some standalone webinars that wouldn't be our usual monthly webinar, which is more focused on our typical topics. The second question is, I am interested in a monthly update on health information technology safety issues. For instance, we could start doing a 10-minute update on this very serious area. And just for our, our reaction panel and speakers, we're seeing an enormous rash of very, very preventable and very serious accidents and healthcare accidents that are occurring as we're adopting the electronic healthcare record, the computerized prescriber order entry, e-prescribing. Uh, we're all adopting these systems that are really form-based systems where we haven't really developed the best safety system. And we're seeing such an enormous wave of this, and it's been at, at the top of the list of everybody, that we're, we're considering having a 10-minute dedicated to it 
each month so we can focus on it. And so we've had a lot of interest, and the question is, would you as an attendee, if you strongly agree, a 10, if you very strongly disagree, a 1. And then the third question is, I would like real case studies on adoption of infection prevention innovations. Uh, just for our speakers who aren't routinely with us, we've had an enormous amount of interest also in preventing infections. These are the infections, the healthcare associated infections we give patients when they come in and we try to take good care of them and then we give them an infection and we've had a tremendous amount of interest there. And we're, our question is, would you you like us to build out some real case studies from real organizations at the front line that are typical of America's uh, hospital systems and healthcare systems. The final three questions are, would you like written case studies with reference, so the statement is, written case studies with references, so like small white papers that have the re references so that you can use them in your own organization that have a case study and then references in the literature so that you've really got them evidence-based and grounded the way we would with an article. This, this next question is, would you like case studies in PowerPoint? And, and you're not making a choice between the two. You're tell, you could give them all a 10 if you want. It, for instance, I would like to have written case studies and the PowerPoint, which is the second question. Would that be of real value? And the third is, do you have a need or could you use video clips uh, that could uh, have other leaders from organizations try to make these points? And so that's uh, the sixth question. So in the right lower hand corner of your screen, uh, you can answer these polling questions. Uh, a, a 10 is strongly uh, agree, and one is, is strongly disagree. So sorry for our panel to interrupt, but since pa Kyle put the polling up, I wanted to make sure people understood the questions, and it'll help guide us as we go forward. We've got a great audience that really guide us. So I'm coming back to Brian Ashiru's question. <coughs> And we'll start with Michael and go right through our group, through right to Dan. And I think, Dan, you kind of missed the last on the round, so we'll give you a chance also to comment on, on the other topic. But Brian is asking, how do we engage physicians? It seems MDs are at the crux of many of these systems issues, and their issues seemingly do not align with the hospital goals. An understatement for sure. In addition, it becomes much more complicated when you throw in the outpatient world of the accountable care organization. And as we start to move to population management and you've got these various constituencies that may not see eye to eye. Michael, and then right through uh, uh, Cliff to Doug to, to Dan. Well, I find a, a very different reaction of different kinds of physicians. Um, and, uh, I mean, you have physicians now who are uh, part of uh, organizations of the Mayo type, like Geisinger and Cleveland Clinic and so on, who are very, very involved in this kind of transformation. Then you have, uh, you have a typical case where you have the hospital world as a bureaucracy, and then you have physicians who are in a craft mode of production, highly individualistic. Um, uh, some health, academic health care organizations, uh, they say to me, you know, our, our philosophy is you eat what you kill, and, uh, and they see all this accountable care organizations or, or collaborative organizations to be communistic organizations. Well, I find the younger when the younger physicians coming out are, are much more interactive, much more open to this than perhaps some of the older. But you're always going to find people with different uh, personality types, and uh, you're always going to find people who would much rather be highly independent, uh, craft, run their own business. But I think on the long run, what we're seeing more and more is people beginning to realize whether it's uh, uh, health care families, accountable care organizations, so on, that if we're going to achieve the triple aim, we're going to have to work in this kind of collaborative learning organization. Cliff. Yeah, I, I, I'm kind of spoiled on this one, and I know exactly where uh, Brian's coming from on the question, because when we look, work in North America or Europe, it's always an issue. And we've got structure in place, frankly, that really doesn't make it easy 
uh, for the physician, even if they care about the topic, to be engaged on an improvement effort. In Singapore, for example, we've had over 120 projects there. Uh, we just launched uh, what we call Wave 15, the Accelerated Model for Improvement. And of those 120 teams, uh, I would say that 95% of those have physician involvement and actually physician leadership. And so it's very rare that I see a team there that doesn't have a physician on it. And they've got a system that actually is in place that actually uh, almost requires that. And uh, so I'm, I'm kind of spoiled, Brian, and I know I feel your pain uh, because when in the U.S. I see it and also in Europe. And we just have structure in place that doesn't make it easy for physicians to actually participate. Any, any tips on, uh, uh, on, on successes in engaging physicians? One of the things that we found has been very successful is to find the young Turk, mid-40s physician that everybody would send their family to that may not be in the bureaucracy because of their age and, their, uh, and where they are in their practice, but that they're the go-to really good physician uh, that, uh, that, that people really uh, care about uh, and, and would send their family to. And although they are the guys with the and women that have the least amount of time, if you can get them as part of the team, it tends to turn the whole herd. Has that been your experience? Is that a question to Michael, me, or? Uh, well, yeah, I, well, you know, I, I'd like to just add that one of the, you see in the book, uh, we interviewed uh, the leadership of the Michigan Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield who have created a lot of these kinds of medical families within the state of Michigan that are led by physicians, all led by physicians, that bring together all kinds of the other healthcare providers working together. So part of it is really creating a model and incentive um, that makes sense to people. Uh, it's very hard to do these things outside of a systemic view. Gotcha. Uh, uh, let's go to uh, to Doug and then Dan, and and also perhaps Doug as a as a, a, a governance person. Any thoughts there uh, uh, as well from that uh, perspective? Uh, thank you. So there's there's two points. One is I like your point is find the young Turk or the find physicians that share the values and you can provide the recognition. That's a key R here. Is it's not necessarily it's not about money so much, is is it it is recognition, giving them a platform to talk about the change they're making. People re will respond to that. Uh, secondly, I found that uh, peer pressure is a big thing and and I would say in a good way that doctors uh, they they want to they want to do well, and one of the things I'm seeing right now at uh, NYU Medical Center is the CEO has set up a process there, Robert Grossman, where the data is transparent on patient outcomes in every area uh, of uh, whether it's in heart or any all the areas that they work across, and he's engaged the physicians in developing the standards on how to measure those outcomes, and then he's made it visible for the physicians to see how do I rate against my peers. And what has happened is the variation has closed very quickly as they have started to learn themselves, taking advantage of this learning organization, and now they're all up in the top performing categories in multiple areas along, through the hospital. It's been a huge change uh, with this, and he has the full support of the board to do it. I, I, have, to, I have to speak up for the uh, older people. I'm becoming one. Uh, but in our, in our book, in Chapter 10, one of our case studies is actually led by a physician, uh, Dr. Jerry Jackson, uh, who, when he started his project of increasing the albumin level uh, for dialysis patients, he got a lot of pushback. But uh, he stayed right with it, and as he produced the improvements, then that created followers amongst the other physicians. And uh, it was just really interesting to watch him work under that kind of pressure. But uh, you'll see the case study in the book, uh, you know, uh, an improvement going back to what Doug said, speaks volumes and really helps move people along. Dan. 
Dan Ford, do you have uh, a comment uh, regarding uh, engagement of physicians and leaders? I do, I do. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, I think um, we. I think it's a tough world uh, for traditional thinking physicians. And I, I agree with the comments. I'm in the same with the comments about the younger ones. Um, I think we just don't let them out of it. Uh, the term Gemba was used in the earlier question, and, and, and so much of what we're doing involves Gemba walks and uh, pushing decisions down and, and respect and uh, valuing everybody. And I think we don't let them out of it. We get them involved with, with various studies and projects and of uh, operational things, uh, I agree with Dr. McAbee in terms of we have too much bureaucratic thinking, and um, we need we we using a traditional term, but but not not in a traditional way. We decisions uh, we we're pushing decisions down, we're pushing decisions across, and we're pushing decisions up. Uh, there's intellectual, practical, and human value for everybody's involvement, and I think I think the the physicians can be can be encouraged to gravitate toward that, especially if the invitation is doctor to doctor, not only to younger, but doctor to doctor. You get the ones who already buy in, and, and you get them to, uh, to just somehow get their colleagues to get in. Great. Uh, we have uh, about three minutes, uh, uh, three minutes to go. Um, uh, Tara Roberts. Are you in support of the ISO 9001 for healthcare organizations, which seems to align with the transformation principles presented today? No, uh, uh, Cliff, do you want to take that? Or, uh, uh, yeah, I'll Michael? just comment on it. I, I think it's important uh, that you know ISO 9000 is about documenting uh, what's going on in the system, and I think having a systems view and having the processes that we're working in and making sure that we're certifying under ISO uh, to those actual work processes is critical. Uh, sometimes I see people get the organizational chart certified and uh, they'll put together a nice little book and then all of a sudden somebody uh, is promoted or transferred out and the only thing worse than not getting certified is being decertified. And so our clients that actually get certification on the work process regardless of what the org chart's doing uh, are usually in a, a better position to make sure that the uh, certification is sustainable. I think it's uh, critical to have the processes under suspicion and have those certified and not the org chart and the departments. Okay, and then Mary Louise Madigan asks, how would I obtain more information on the Michigan Blue Cross Blue Shield model? Uh, uh, well, it, 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 you, there's a reference in our book, but I think you could uh, go directly uh, to ask them. I mean, I went and asked their leaders uh, to describe what they were doing, but they did testimony actually before Congress. You can get a hold of that. Uh, the reference is in our uh, is in our book. And they, they have a good Great. website too, don't they, Michael? Great. And, and what I would like to ask is um, is the book is just chock full of really valuable information. For those that want to read, have you created book summaries? Uh, do you have a website? Do you have uh, content that we could go to uh, that would allow us to, uh, uh, to to get introduced to it or to be able to kind of uh, uh, familiarize ourselves with the summary content? Yeah, Cliff, Cliff has done that. Cliff, do you want to tell us about it? And then, Doug, we're going to go to you and ask you about your new blog and leadership and, and where people could go to see that. Yeah, the, um, the Wiley actually has for people who are – uh, using the book to teach and so forth, uh, they've actually posted uh, PowerPoint slides for each of the chapters. Uh, Jane uh, is uh, busy right now writing tests uh, for uh, educators. So like the book right now is being used at uh, Texas Tech uh, University in the doctoral nursing program there by Dr. Alexa Green. And so she's been using the slides and she's also been using the test bank. So those things are available on the Wiley site for people who are using the book to actually uh, teach on would the be, uh, well, Cliff. Would those be for free? Would those be to public access? I, I I don't know about public access, but I'm I'm pretty sure that anybody who's using the book to teach uh, has access to all of that. Okay. Okay. And uh, we've got a lot of educators that are on our uh, on our system. Yeah. Uh, and on the blog uh, apiweb.org, 
uh, we have a blog that we have there has just been established and uh, most of the materials that we have there papers uh, written by my colleagues for the British Medical Journal on various topics uh, would be available. Again, that's apiweb.org, O-R-G. Alpha Papa, right? A-P-I, India, A-P-I. Exactly. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, Doug, Doug, can you share with us your, your recent work in leadership as we wrap up and where we might be able to take advantage of that? Oh, well, thank you. I'm, I'm writing for the Harvard Business Review, a blog on a, a, and it's under uh, blogs.hbr.org. You can find that. The most recent blog post I have is three questions executives should ask frontline workers. And uh, you might be interested in that. You can visit that at the HBR uh, blog site. Fantastic. Well, listen, what we'd like to do now as we wrap up, and we've gone through uh, those that are ha having the polling, I just want to remind all of you that uh, June we're going to have Mary Foley, a longtime uh, co-author of articles in patient engagement, a wonderful champion for patient safety, uh, and uh, for the former uh, uh, president of the American Nursing Association, as well as Karen Curtis, who's a wonderful champion for patient uh, advocacy. And the two of them are going to present uh, new content uh, regarding engagement of patients and families and uh, really build on the body of work, the joint body of work that they've both uh, uh, created. And uh, I think this will be a really good uh, practical webinar that really will focus on the, the nursing uh, issues and, and direct patient care. I'd like to thank uh, all, of, uh, all of you who have spoken today uh, and um, uh, really have done a great job. I highly recommend the book and, the, and then uh, also Doug's uh, uh, blog. I'd like to turn it over to Dan, uh, who has just been a, a, a long, long-standing champion for leadership and has really been a wonderful voice for engaging patients and families and really champion the cause of getting patients and families uh, involved in root cause analysis and breaking through some of these these traditions we have that could really open the door to much greater improvement in care. Dan, we'd like to have you close us, and then we'll uh, sign off for today. Dan? Yes, thanks, Chuck. Uh, thank you for, once again, facilitating another good learning experience. I suspect this has been a bit of a gimbal walk uh, for all of us. And uh, I thank the speakers uh, and the reactors. Thank you for those who um, have listened in the audience, the participants. Um, don't forget Esther. I think it was Cliff that mentioned the patient, Esther. Whatever you do, and don't forget Esther. And lastly, uh, to keep Julie Tao um, yeah, in your yeah. thoughts and your prayers uh, with the unfortunate death of uh, one of her sons. Thank you. So we'll close. I'd like to have the speakers just stay on so we can do a rapid uh, improvement loop to see what we can do better for next time. But uh, uh, God bless you all, and we hope you have a wonderful uh, uh, rest of this month.